it's it's an odd one because I've never been a um a, a early adopter of anything. <laughs> I'm not a techie, hence the non techie um a, a business name. I'm not a technical person at all. My my first experience of AI was I was running a marketing agency up until recently. And um, I've just wound it up to focus on the AI stuff. Um, but two, about two years ago, so before ChatGPT came out, I started to use an AI tool um, for for one. We got a massive contract in, um, and it was much bigger than what we were used to. And it was a big brand wanting to sell these ten million pound products. Um, and I basically, cut long story short, I found an AI tool just by accident, just got by googling around and seeing, you know, what what can help me do the thing that I'm imagining I can do to help them. And I found this AI tool. And it was magical. We, we got incredible results for this client. And then we did it again. And then we did it again. And my, my curiosity was, um, well, my interest was peaked, I think, at that point around what AI is. Um, skip forward maybe five or six months and ChatGPT came out. And I think spurred on by that past experience, I then began to think, right, okay, this is something I really, I, I need to, I remember it's just stopping. I saw it. I started playing with it. I don't remember my, but jaw dropping going wow this is something like i've never seen anything like this before in my life welcome to the fix sit down with copywriting experts nick o'connor and glenn fisher as they review discuss and improve real world copy sent in by you this is the fix at the time it was this how this is how i'm going to differentiate my agency we are going to be AI first we're gonna this AI thing can help us do services it can help us I could see it straight away from just playing this is going to be able to help us be much more efficient we can do new things with it we can t- t- show other people what we're doing we can maybe sell things onto other people there is so much potential here because as a small agency we were really we were struggling we was kind of you know up and down and up and down we got this you know these couple of clients and then we had enterprise style clients that were kind of closing and closing I could see us going on a slow slide. So I knew we needed to do something. I thought this was the thing. So I decided, I don't do things by halves. So I decided I'm going to dedicate about three hours minimum every single day, including Christmas Day, to just, I'd I'd get a bit obsessive about things, to just spending on AI stuff. So learning what I can, experimenting, interviewing AI founders, just just gathering knowledge as much as I could. And then I found out so many interesting things. I just started to share them on my LinkedIn (laughs) And I thought, oh, this is good. And then conversations started to happen naturally. When I said, oh, have you, have you seen this? Or just je- out of genuine excitement. Oh, we've just done this and this has just happened. And that started to go. And then people started to say, oh, can you show me how to do this? Showed them how. And I realized I actually really enjoy showing people how to do this in this way that I understand. Because I'm never going to understand the technical side of things. Um, and I don't want to. I wanted to know how, we, how it works for me, not how it works. Yeah. Um, and that's become my little bit of a, a bit of a slogan. And I was just fascinated that I had access to all these these techie things, and I knew how to use them without being a techie person. Without you, without yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's fascinating, it's genuinely fascinating. There's a few things in there that I, I want to pick about, and unfortunately, I'm not intelligent enough to hold all these thoughts in my head. But I'll attempt. Um, the first thing I wanted to just just take away from that was a your um, amazing and admirable um, organic. Or your openness to organic discovery and just flowing with something that's that's not a that's a kind of i'm, I'm hesitating to say god given because i'm you know, <laughs> religious views are not relevant in this but um if that's a different uh thing altogether maybe not in the AI, ai world i don't know but that that is like a, a really interesting thing to go all right that's interesting and showing that natural curiosity is is amazing and interesting it just shows how that can organically start as a small thing just like oh that's interesting what's that what's that oh that and just going with the flow is like quite a good life lesson and business lesson to take anyway but i before that i just thought that moment when you obviously you'd seen the potential in the work you did for the client and all right okay this can make money this can do this thing this can help help uh my job and help me offer something different but was it just that or was there something else? Was there an, another element? And I'm just interested, you might not know the answer, you might not have thought about it, but so much of the AI piece, as they say, is 
met with fear and it's to be scared of AI, to be scared of what it can do, to be scared of some of the positive things that you talked about, efficiency and, and help and all these things, to be scared of it. What? Why weren't you scared of it? Or, or were you? Uh, what, what, what made you lean? Obviously, I can tell it immediately. You're a positive person. You're pushing forward. You're looking for ways like that. Was it that? What was the thing that kind of, what, why didn't you fear it? Um, it's a really strange thing. I think uh, excitement was my main emotion that I found that sort of drowned everything out. It's not to say at all that I haven't had many, many moments of going, oh, wow, oh, my God, the world is going to change dramatically. What What's going to happen here? And I frequently do. I think it's um, my attitude, but it, it's here. It's very much here. And it, to ignore it is, is you know, you, you can't. It's not possible. It's like trying to ignore the Internet. Um yeah. Uh, so I, I'm embracing it, but I'm also keeping myself educated with all those risks and dangers so I can be aware of them and not accidentally walk into problems. But I do think, you know, I, I, I never really think too much about the distant future, about in an, an AI, like that distant future could be five years' time. So I really do think the world is going to dramatically change and it does scare me. But I'm a bit of a kind of right here, right now type person. I live yeah. very much in the present thinking right now I could do some good stuff and as I've kind of expanded my network of other people in AI, I'm seeing some really good stuff, people using AI for good and, and incredibly inspiring stuff that's making me think, let's, let me get to know it really well, let me show people and teach people, build a product, exit, and then I can go and use it for good myself. So that's, my, that's become my plan as well. But yeah, the, there is definitely fear. I'm, I think it'd be stupid not to be scared of it. Um, yeah. It, yeah, the the overarching feeling I'm having is is excitement and the, the yeah no it's, it's fascinating it's fascinating to um to to hear I'm, I'm I kind of I mean I could spend ages and I'm, I'm unfortunately it's raising I'm kind of trying to keep it on the AI uh, thing at the moment but I'd, I'm fascinated to hear more from you about your past and how you got into the space where you were. Um, but and perhaps we can do that at, at Fix Fest and uh, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to talk there. But I'm thinking, like you saying, that you're doing all of this research. You're looking at these things um, as they're happening. You're in the moment. You're present in the space of AI at the moment. What is most exciting you about AI um, in this present moment? What's what's the things that you kind of go, "Oh, that's cool," or um, "I'm really enjoying using that." What where's where do you find it's most helping you out at the moment? What are the coolest things you're using? I think first of all, just overall the the rate of innovation and the feedback loop, how tight the feedback loops are. So if, if on something like ChatGPT, if you think, oh, usually if you're using some form of software and you think that bit's really annoying, you don't for a second think it's going to be fixed within a couple of weeks. You probably wouldn't even think to give any feedback. So ChatGPT doesn't make it easy to give feedback, but they're getting feedback from somewhere because I guarantee they'll not only have fixed it, but they'll have added loads of other features to prevent that from happening in the, in the first place. I find the the fact that they're all battling with each other, ChatGPT and Claude and Gemini, all these companies battling with each other to be better means that we can't, we, day on day, there's something new to see, which is so endlessly exciting for people with magpie syndrome like me. It's kind of, oh, brilliant, oh, something new. So it's all constantly new every day. It never gets boring. Um but there's just, there's so much. I think I'm, I'm really interested, particularly in the realm of agents, AI agents. So you kind of have, um, you sort of have a little bit of a sequence, most people. So you will um, learn to prompt with LLMs, so like ChatGPT and Claude. You'll learn to kind of how to request information from them and how to get what you want out of it. That's kind of the first stage. And then you're going to start to build your own custom version of that, custom GPT. Super easy to do. It takes 10 minutes to build one. Um, and, you, and you start to think, right, I'll add my own information into that as a point of reference. And then it goes into um, agents. Um, so you can have, you can build, and I'm still learning how to do this, you can build a, like a, a leader agent that controls other agents, and each one of those has tools, AI tools, and skills. So you've got an actual team, um, that so you give them a problem, and they collaborate together, work out the best way to, to come up with a solution, and then carry out the solution and give you the results. So you're not actually manually asking a question or waiting for a response, giving feedback or waiting for a response. That's all happening completely autonomously, which wow. is just crazy. So I think one of the most exciting things about all of it is it's leveling playing fields, cliche, but it really is. Enterprises have got exactly the same opportunity as one man bands like me at the moment, which is I can build and get 
you know, make my one person business, I'm now one person, so much bigger. I can hit higher revenue um, goals now, just as me with these AI agents uh, potentially. And I think that's what excited me the most at the moment. It's blowing my mind as well. But... Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear more, certainly at FixFest itself. I, I'm a little bit of a challenge just because I, I can imagine people probably experience this and you've certainly from the sounds of it experienced it and you called it magpie syndrome which i like how do you what you're obviously um an experienced person in running businesses and um managing your time and doing uh, having focus and you clearly think you've got that like obsession and that those elements which is some of the magic that makes that possible but how do you, with something where there is so much opportunity with AI, once you are able to overcome any fears people might have or worries about that stuff and you start going, oh, actually, I see that as an opportunity to see that as an opportunity, that's an opportunity. How do you control that kind of magpie syndrome of there being so much? Do you almost shift anal- back to an- analog and being like, right, I'm going to use these old principles and, and guide myself? What's your, what's your thoughts there? I'm, I'm interested in that. It's it limited, limited, like physically limiting it with time blocking. Um, so you have like have blocks of experimentation time, and then t- rigorous testing. I say rigorous, rigorous for me. Um, testing of what will work and what won't work. And, and again, it's a very different world because if you want to try out a new tool, it's not a case of try it out and that's it. And if it does, you don't like it, stick it in the bin. And if you do, you keep it because all of these tools are changing. So the tool you like might not exist in a couple of weeks' time. The tool you hate might get 10 times better in a couple of weeks' time. So it's le- I've been kind of teaching myself to sort of sniff out the potential in the tool as well. So that testing, so you kind of find up, find potential in the experimentation phase and then having testing and, you know, trying to integrate these tools into every day and trying to put them into workflows. Um, so there's a, like a, bl- a bit of the old school when it comes to workflows. How can this make, how can this optimize this process a little bit better? But then a lot of experimentation. Does that answer your question? I feel like I didn't answer your question. I, I, whether it did, it was interesting to, uh, to, to <laughs> say whatever. And my questions are so vague and uh, often uh, rambling that we can uh, easily get down, lost down uh, different pathways. Um, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the you were you were saying about the the fact that there there is all these options, there's all this stuff. But what's something that um, caught my ear? Um, and I, I always think in terms of like objections and what people are worrying about, um, especially in the AI space. You were you mentioned you you spoke to the idea of things still being unfinished, uh, the, the the potential, the things that you're still experimenting, and I think that's a quality that um, it's it's good to be like that i encourage that it, it, from a copywriting point of view it's like nothing's finished nothing's final you, you're just trying to improve and try and um all these iterations it, it seems to me that with ai in the space it is at the moment there will still be errors there will be still be mistakes there will be path, paths that you go down and go oh actually that doesn't work out for me in that particular world how how do you like what's your thoughts on that kind of thing and, and being open to failure if you like or it, that makes it sound more dramatic but a thing that you might think oh that's a way and then it doesn't peter out how do you manage that yeah i think um the the companies that are doing the one that i work i do lots of ai training with companies and the ones that are getting the best results have um incentivized play uh with these tools so they've kind of come up with little challenges but not told people how they've not instructed people as to how to get there so it's kind of here's a thing find a tool that will help you get to this thing and they are doing really well they're the ones that are advancing and progressing to these next stages and they're calling me in to ask help them build stuff now um instead of still being stuck at that prompting phase so experimentation and play is yeah it's it's critical at this point and also accepting that the ai tool people the, the the creators are still experimenting themselves we've got these tools have been built quickly and have gone to market really quickly too so they're full of glitches. So kind of to expect that, you know, we wouldn't normally expect that in a piece of software that we use and we've bought and we, we've integrated. If it, if it glitched, you go, oh my God, where's the support, tech support? That, that's not, you have to kind of 
chuck that idea away for things like ChatGPT glitches on me or has an error probably 10 times a day, but just carry on. You kind of need to know how to work around it like you're working with a kind of like a beta version or something. Yeah. And that no, I, this is a big giant world of betas. Yeah, no, I think that's, I, it just dawned on me then because I think that's, um, it is something that I think a lot of people would are probably getting to that point where people go, I'll give it a try and I'll have a look. And then yeah. they might do something and go, Oh, this don't work, or this is this isn't all it cracked up to be, or what have you. I think, but it's it's one of the, it's it's not like a finished product where you might buy it off the shelf and and expect it to be of a certain quality, of a certain design, or even the the, the concept of a product means it does something. We don't still know what it can do, yeah, even exactly. with all these things. So it's a very unique thing in its in in that sense as well. And I think. Yeah. Being open to though that is is a key thing for for us the user and to go into that knowing that we don't quite know what's uh, how it's working and what's going on. Yeah, and also the, the the learning curve to it. So just because you can open it and use it straight away and you can get a result doesn't mean there isn't a learning curve. And with things like ChatGPT, there's no instruction manual. You open it up and you kind of well, what do I do with this? <laughs> do I you know where do I get the information from? There's no credible source. Hence me doing what I'm doing, but I want to build myself as a credible source. Um, so, you know, you kind of go, well, write me a, a limerick or, you know, you don't really know what to do when you start it, depending on your background. I just wrote something in the, I think my very first prompt was um, write me a song in the style of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or something like, it was just something like that. And I thought, great. And then I started to go, oh, do this. Oh, hang on a second. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, realizing that there is a learning curve is really important, that you do need to put a bit of time into learning how to instruct it. So, even though it, you can speak with it conversationally, there is a technical side to it, or not necessarily technical. There's a rule book and there's a structure if you want to get good results. And that's not openly published anywhere. <laughs> well, it is, I suppose they have, they have these guides, like ChatGPT has a guide, Gemini has a guide. But these are very, very long documents and often they're written by technical people. So they're not very accessible at all. Sure. But one of the things I plan to do is, is take all the Gemini ones are quite good actually. But I tend to plan to take those and make really easy versions of them. So you do actually have an instruction book. Sure. I'm starting with chat GPT. Here we go. Um, so I'm yeah. going to rescue to that to that extent. I don't I don't expect you to uh, provide the entire guide right now. But for for people who are maybe uh, listening to this, watching this, and thinking, okay, okay, like I get it. Like Glenn, you're talking about AI, you're doing fixed fest around AI, you're doing this. Like, I'm relatively skeptical on on that side of things not skeptical yeah. but just i'm just getting old frankly um <laughs> i feel like my granddad just going what's a dvd but <laughs> i'm kind of learning and going into it more and going all right okay yeah i can use that like that i can do this and what have you people who are, are gonna watch us talking to people like yourself and go all right okay okay that's interesting okay where what would you recommend to someone who's going okay let me have a look at this what's the first thing you would do um with with something like a chat gpt or or what have you um i always say these three these three c's for basic prompting which is um character context and clarity so um something people often forget to do and that and it annoys me when i see prompts that haven't got a character is um Imagine you have a task, a task to do, and you walk into a room and the ideal person to help you with that task is sat in the room. So what's their job title? What's their background? What are their skills? Start your prompt with that. So you, you say you, your task is you want to, to um, create some ideas around LinkedIn posts. So it'd be great to speak to a LinkedIn ghostwriter, but even better to speak, speak to a LinkedIn ghostwriter that has 10 years experience in AI. <laughs> you, know, you can you can give them this background so you, you can start to refine it's, these these LLMs are drawing from this massive, massive data set and you need to give it, you narrow that down as much as you possibly can with as much context as you possibly can too. So give it a character, let it know who you are as well. It doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know where you're approaching this task from. So a character for you, for, for it, a character for you. And then just give it as much detail as you can. And I think the best thing, um, particularly for this audience, think of a really good copywriting brief. So if you've got a brand new copywriter, you give them a brief. It contains information about your company, your purpose, your values. It's got um, or, uh, examples of previous copy. That's amazing for for prompts. Um, so a good prompt has the level of detail that a really good copywriting brief would have in. So it's very specific as to outputs. 
Um, it's very clear and you've, you've got characters as well. So set the character, think of it like a brief. That wasn't as, as smooth as I, I, I find it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no like, like AI, we're still working out these things. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't want to even say it, and I'm not going to say it, but regular uh, listeners to the show will know my uh, my current uh, forward expletive um, prompt that I'm working on, and I, I feel like I want to say it then. I'm not going to do it. That's a, a special hook that even you, Heather, don't quite know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, and on that note, that basis, um, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time, especially me rambling on. Um, I... Even just talking to you for this short time, because of your experience and because of that, um, because of the what you've been doing, it, it just opens up so much like, oh, right, oh, yeah, there's opportunity there, opportunity there. And I know people listening to this will be like, oh, all right, okay, I didn't think about it like that. Um, so I am absolutely gassed, as they say, uh, in American high school, probably. I don't know. I think that's where they say it. Uh, to see you talk at Fix Fest, I cannot wait. Um, if people would like to um, join us and see you speak, uh, there's links everywhere to to find a ticket. Uh, we're we're over. I think we're we're over halfway full. So don't hang about if if you don't want to miss out. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful day, uh, Heather. I can't wait to meet you in person and find out more about um, how you pre AI, Heather. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm intrigued to hear. Uh, and how this uh, magpie-based, uh, d- very driven person uh, came into being. Um, but thank you so much for your time. And thank you for, even in that short space of time, um, giving a lot of, lot of uh, suggestions and ways that you can start using AI to, uh, to help you and, and showing that as, as it shows in your career already and what you've been doing. And what, what is it maybe, how many years have you been kind of on, on the AI kind of front? Of not not lot long at all two two years two years yeah I mean that's a, a, a an enormously small space of time really yet oh, so yeah. much stuff can can be developed so uh, certainly not being left behind now is the time to uh, start taking your lead and uh, seeing what you what you're about so uh, so thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you in July yeah me too thank you very much Glenn if you enjoy the fix and want to get access to even more good stuff. Join the Fix Accelerator today. Get access to special masterclasses from Nick and me. Watch expert interviews with industry legends. Join live copy feedback sessions every week and get connected to our very own private copy network. Visit thefixaccelerator.com for more information.